All right, good morning, everyone. Find your seats, please. It's good to see you. I know, I know it might have been an emotional week for some, seeing the Sedin's jerseys retired. I'm still not over the last Stanley Cup run, so it was particularly difficult to see that. Uh, I also had, a, I had an emotional week because I had to uh, take my oldest daughter to her grade 8 orientation at uh, Panorama Ridge, and I'm not quite ready for that reality yet. So it's good to be in church and just kind of like unload all of the junk I'm going through with my daughter growing up too fast. Uh, this morning we are continuing in our series looking at the life of David, and David is one of those people in the Bible that we just tend to aspire to. He is a shepherd. He was a king. He was the giant killer. He was the, the poet and the musician. And this list goes on of, of, of things. We go, man, David, I want to be like David. And along with that list, there's a second list that David is also a betrayer, a liar, an adulterer, a murderer. And we often push that part aside. But to be honest, that list is more encouraging to me because it shows that he is just as human and just as broken and just as messed up as all of us. And if someone like him who had one list of all these incredible attributes and a second list of things we would pray we never fell prey to, if someone like that can still be described as a man after God's own heart, there's hope for all of us. So this morning, we're going to look at his life, and uh, as a man after God's own heart, We can look at him as an example of what it means to live for God. We can look at him as an example of what it means to be someone who, as the title says, earnestly seeks after what God has for him. And this morning, we're going to look very specifically at this idea of the consistency of worship and devotion towards God in David's life. And there's there's no really one verse that kind of says, like, here is who David is and here is his heart of worship. Rather, if you look at the entirety of his story, it's painted all across his story. You look at all of the Psalms that he wrote, and it's not one verse, it's an entirety of his narrative that unpacks the idea that he was a worshiper. He had a heart of worship, no matter the circumstance. And we're going to turn, just to start us off, to Psalm 63. It'll be on the screen. It's the first five verses. I try to find something that's kind of like get us into the mindset of who David was as a person who had a heart of worship for God. So he wrote this. He wrote this, I believe, while he was in the wilderness running from Saul. And he said, you, God, are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. And you hear in those words someone who just lives and breathes what worship and devotion to God looks like. And this morning, we're just going to unpack this idea of, of a heart of worship. And heart of worship, for me, really quick, it looks like a heart that is soft, that is open, that is vulnerable. A heart that, that longs for the presence of God. A heart that wants nothing else but to be with the Lord and have the Lord be with them and speak to them. And the amazing thing about David's life is whether he was facing difficulties, whether he was celebrating the highest of highs, whether he was confronted with his own brokenness and his own failings, his response time and time again was a response of worship. And today what we're going to do is look at some snapshots of his life that kind of teach us some very specific principles of what it, what it means to have a, a heart of worship. And the big idea for this morning is this. David's heart of worship and his devotion to God guided him through all of his life. The good times, the bad times, and the truly awful times. His heart of worship guided him through all of his life. So I ask you as we start, do you have a heart of worship and devotion to God that follows in the example of David? Is your default response in life, when, when life throws stuff at you, is your default response, hey Siri or hey Google or hey Alexa, give me the answer. Or is your default response, God, earnestly I seek you. Earnestly I seek you. Let's pray. God, I pray, I ask this morning as we open your word, as we look at uh, David's story and how he responded in his heart of worship, God, I pray that you just reveal to us what we can do to cultivate, to create a heart of worship in each of our lives. God, I pray that we would be people that would turn to you no matter the circumstance. So when life throws, all that life throws at us, the good times and the bad times, that our response would be, God, earnestly, earnestly I seek you. I long to worship you. I long to be with you. Would you speak to us this morning in Jesus' name? Amen. 
One, one quick disclaimer, because we often kind of get into this trap when we talk about worship, it is so often in church, worship and music are so intricately entwined. And of course, music is worship. Not all music is worship, but music and worship are entwined. Um, we're going to try to look at some various expressions, and, and David, as a worshiper, his key expressions of worship were music, it was poetry, it was dance. Those are his key expressions. Uh, I want to talk a little about my story with worship, and my key expression of worship is music. But I want to make sure I say off the top, worship and music are not the only be-all and end-all. And as we go through, I hope we can unpack some variety of ways that we can worship beyond just music. But I felt really led to share a little bit about my story um, of how I was able to cultivate a heart of worship, what God did in my life. Um, from a young age, I had a love for music. There are photos. I did not find them. I put them on the screen today for a variety of reasons. But there are photos of me with my parents' pots and pans. I'm playing air guitar on a frying pan. I think I was playing drums on various pots from a young age. I remember as like a kid, like 8, 9, 10, and you were, you were free to laugh at me. I've already dealt with it. But we had a, the Little Mermaid soundtrack on cassette tape. And we would pick up my, my classmates to go to, to track meets. I don't know if you remember this. And I would sing along to every single word of the Little Mermaid soundtrack. And with my friends look at me like, what are you doing right now? I guess I had music in my heart and it had to get out. Um, I played trumpet in band in high school. I grew up in what is called the MTV generation in the early 90s. Of course, in Canada, it was the much music generation. Uh, and my sister and I, probably to my parents, just chagrin. We watched far too many hours of music video after music video after music video. I mean, much music like shaped me as a young person. And um, I had a very distinct uh, 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 genres that I liked. I really liked alternative music at the time. And I would say that as a teenager growing up, uh, worship music didn't do a lot for me. The 90s were the, were the era of uh, Shine, Jesus Shine, Step by Step, um, Shout to the Lord. And a lot of those songs like we laugh and we go like, we'll bring them back for like a retro worship set. And Erica is bound to do it now that I've said it. But um, those songs didn't really resonate with me as a teenager who was like angsty and wanted to listen to like alternative music like Nirvana and Pearl Jam and the rise of the grunge scene, right? And I grew, uh, I grew out of that into, I went to Bible college. And I remember Erica and I met, and I'll never forget this. I have very few regrets in my life. I regret this decision. She invited me to a worship together conference at UBC with Matt Redman and Tim Hughes and Delirious. And I was like, yeah, I'm not interested. Like, I don't like that music. Like, have fun. Go on your own. I regret that decision to this day because she still talks about what God spoke to her at that conference and what she learned from those worship leaders. And I'll never forget this, like, revelation moment. I was in college. It was early 2000s. It was the rise of, of the, the, the reemergence of punk rock and the underground indie scene and emo music, and I was all into that. And then I was going to Kingsway Forest at the time, and Pastor Barry's daughter, Shalon, Shalon, who's one of the most incredible musicians I've ever met, she um, really shaped who I am as a musician. She went to Hillsong College of Music for a couple years. She came back, she put into my hands the, uh, the yellow album from Hillsong United. And that was that revelation moment where God just grabbed a hold of me. And I heard music for the very first time that spoke to me. It was, and if you don't know the story, Hillsong United at that point, it was a bunch of teenagers who were like, we're going to do something to write songs for our generation, for our people. And I heard that music and suddenly the music I loved in the secular arena, that style, that teenage, just like youthful energy was transported into worship music. And from the moment that first like beat and that first guitar like hit, I was like, I've never heard anything like this. And in that moment, God began to do something in my heart that has not been undone to this day. And that was a, a unique time of worship music. It was Hillsong United came out. David Crowder came out in America and just revamped what worship could even look like. And even though we kind of joke now, Chris Tomlin hit at that point too. And he came at a point with like, he brought the sound of U2 from the early 80s into worship music. And it was a revelation. It was like, who does this? And all that hit at the same time. And God has grabbed a hold of my heart. I remember like a couple years later grabbing the United Blue album and driving. We did Evermore from that album this morning. And driving in line with something. is having goosebumps for like an hour. Just hearing God speak to me through that music. I guess he began his birth as consuming passion for worship music. And to this day, it's one of the predominant ways that he speaks to me and he reveals things to me and he uh, works in my life. And even like a couple weeks ago, we were at um, one conference in Portland, Oregon. A bunch of, <laughs> obviously Dan and Leanne were there. We were there with a bunch of young leaders. And on the Friday night, Kim Walker-Smith led us in worship. 
And just for context, uh, Erica led for 25 minutes this morning, 10 songs. 10 songs, 25 minutes. Kim Walker-Smith, one hour, five songs. <laughs> just, just for context. And about halfway through that hour of worship, we were just singing this one line, um, Jesus, like nothing else will do, nothing else will do, I just want you. And I just stood there with arms raised, and I was like, in this moment, there is truly no place else I want to be. There is nothing else I would rather be doing. God, all I want in this moment is just you, and I never want this moment to end. And 15-year-old me would have never said that, because I would not want to sing shout to the Lord for an hour. But almost, almost 40-year-old me um, was just standing in their arms raised, going, God, I don't want to be anywhere else but in your presence right now. It's unbelievable. And I, I share that story not to say, like, there's David, and then there's me when it comes to heart of worship. I share that story to say it didn't happen overnight. It could. God can work whatever way he wants, but it didn't happen overnight. It took time. I had to grow and develop the heart of worship. Some of that is reflective and indicative of who I was at the time and some things that had to be stripped away. But it's not this, like, miraculous thing always just happens overnight. If you miss it, you miss it. That I had to develop it, and I had to grow it. And the thing that I really wanted to share before we get into David's story is this. God took what was already present in my life. He took a passion that he had planted in my heart as a young child, and he allowed that to be the doorway to create a heart of worship. And I believe that every single person here, you have passions in your life that God has planted into your heart. It might be music, it might be dance, it might be visual arts, it might be writing, it might be athletics, it might be cleaning, it might be parenting, it might be a variety of things. And there's something when we take that and we lay it at God's feet and say, this passion you gave me, show me how to use it as worship to you. And when we do that in that moment, that's where our heart of worship is birthed. When we take this passion that, he, that we already have and say, God, you gave this to me, show me how to worship you with it. That is where our heart of worship is birthed. So we're going to move to, to David's story. We're going to look at three different snapshots in his life. Um, my story is kind of the practical application. His story is some of the philosophical and the principal application. But turn with me to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6. Just for context, we're picking up mid-story. We're going to fill in some of the gaps as we go. I'm kind of telling the narrative out of order this morning. But in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we're jumping into the middle of a story where David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And if you know Old Testament history, Moses uh, and the Israelites, they had the Ark of the Covenant in the wilderness. It was the place where God's presence resided. It was a very important artifact. It's a very important piece of Israel's history. And for a variety of reasons, and we'll get to it in a little bit, it had become lost, and it had not, no, was no longer in a place of prominence. And David said, as I am becoming king, as I am establishing Jerusalem as the, the capital city of the nation of Israel, we need this back in the centerpiece. So we pick up in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. And it says, David wearing a linen ephod, which is a priestly garment. It's like a long, almost dress-like thing with no sleeves, just for the visual. David wearing a linen ephod danced before the Lord with all of his might. Well, he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Verse 19, then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd. In essence, he's throwing a massive party for God's presence coming back to Jerusalem. Go to verse 20. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. She wasn't a fan of what he had done. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me, rather than your father or anyone from his house, when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. Verse 22, I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And I think the first question to look at in this is, in in Michael's eyes, what was the offense? And I'll give you one big hint. The offense was not that he danced. 
And I'm going to try on like dangerous territory here, but I think for a number of years, the church has equated dancing with the offense. It's okay to dance. It's okay to dance in church. It's okay to dance for the Lord. Dancing is not the offense. The offense, and commentaries have a couple different takes on it. One is just the the pure literal thing that he was dancing basically in his underwear. That he had stripped off and was wearing like what some commentators say, a skin-tight undergarment that left nothing to the imagination. And in that moment, that was the offense. She was offended that he had disrobed, that he had possibly shown parts of himself that he shouldn't have in his joy for the Lord and had, you know, humiliated himself and humiliated her. What I think is probably more the case is this. In order to do that, he, he removed his royal robes. He made a very specific choice to take off the garment of a king and to present himself in the garment of a priest to be less royal and more common. And for Michael, his wife, who is so obsessed, you can see in her language, so obsessed with status and with power and with appearance, the idea that her husband, the king, would lower himself and take off the robe of royalty and become like a common, a commoner and just dance unashamed and abandoned for the Lord was just too much for. Her. And interestingly enough, that image of him taking off the priestly, the, the royal robes and assuming the role of a priest reminds me an awful lot of Jesus kneeling and washing his disciples' feet and taking on the role of a servant. And I, I thought as I was reading this this week, it's interesting because we read this story and go, yeah, David, dance with the Lord in his underwear. We should, we should follow that example. But honestly, if I was to illustrate that this morning, that would be inappropriate, wouldn't it? Like, we go, yeah, go David. But if, like, the pastor was to, like, disrobe on stage and, and dance before you in worship to God, we'd be like, that's not okay. <laughs> right? And you think of it like he was, he was a head of state. He was the leader of Israel. If a head of state was caught on camera lounging in his sweatpants and T-shirt, being undignified. That is instant internet, internet memes. That is instant, like, call for action. Like, what an idiot. That guy shouldn't be leading a nation. He's such a goofball. Like, we, we take this story that we hold up as this, like, David, dance for the Lord. And if you put it into modern context, we go, no, that's not okay. And suddenly we are the wife. We are saying, how can you do that? How can you undignify yourself that way? You know, the, the example of David is the one we must follow. David was so absorbed in joyful worship of his God. And it wasn't just like in song. It was like a full body experience for him. He was so just given over to what he wanted to celebrate and to just dance and to be as undignified as possible because it didn't matter what anybody thought. It only mattered what God thought. And the application for us here, this is what I would call the public application. It is the, the part of the message this morning that is most conducive to what happens when we gather together publicly. Because I think that often, as a church, we are inhibited in our worship because we're worried about what others are going to think of us. Often we are inhibited. We're like, I really want to say amen out loud, but someone's going to think I'm weird if I shout that out right now. You know, I really want to raise my hands and abandon, but what is is someone else going to think of me? I really want to come to the front and bow before my king, but I I can't handle if somebody sees that I'm, I'm so broken that I need to do that. And I think it's so... Just interesting that in a place where we all love Jesus, what do we have to lose by doing that? Right? If we're all here to worship, if we're all here to love the Lord our God, what do we have to lose if one person wants to dance, one person wants to bow, one person wants to sit, one person wants to raise their hands, one person wants to shout amen at the top of their lungs? We have nothing to lose. We all love Jesus. So why are we so concerned with appearances? Why are we so concerned with what someone next to us is thinking? We can be so reserved and so self-aware that we end up worshiping God in a bulletproof cage of self-conscious reservation. And when we worship, there's this term that was coined by a song years ago, we worship for an audience of one. We're not worshiping. I'm not worshiping for all of you. When Erica leads worship, she's not worship leading for all of you. She's worship leading for an audience of one. I'm playing the drums for an audience of one. Hopefully you are here singing for an audience of one. Because it doesn't matter what others think, but it matters greatly what God thinks of our worship. And if you've read the Old Testament, he is <laughs> not too far gone to call his people out when they bring him hollow, hollow and empty in ritualistic praise. He did it over and over again when he's like, you're bringing to me something that's just a formality. I want your heart. I want your heart. So the application for here is we need to, to learn to embrace abandon. Embrace abandon. Worship with 
everything that you have. Hold nothing back. Give all that you have because you have nothing to lose in this place. Second story is this. Turn to First Chronicles. We are just going to be right in the Old Testament. First Chronicles um, chapter 13. And this gives some of the background context to the dancing for the Lord part. First Chronicles 13. Um, I'm going to give the context really quick. Before David was Saul, and under Saul, worship of the Lord in Israel had languished. Under Saul, worship had become something that was not really done as much. Uh, the worship of Yahweh really was so dis- diminished under Saul that there was a point in time where he decided, rather than worshiping God or earnestly seeking God, Saul decided that the best course of action was to consult a witch. Um, it was the witch of Endor, for any Star Wars fans. Connection confirmed. But um, he consulted the, the witch of Endor, a spiritual medium, because worship had languished to such a point where he thought the best choice of action was to go to a witch for counsel. And what we see in David is he longs to renew worship in the nation of Israel. He longs to renew worship of Yahweh. He longs to bring the neglected Ark of the Covenant, the the symbol of God's presence, into his new capital city as a sign that the Lord, the true King of Israel, would once again be in the midst of his people, to be central to all they do. David wants the center of Yahweh worship to be the capital city of Jerusalem. And what he does here in 1 Chronicles is he seeks to get buy-in from the people. And this is the most incredible thing, is that David elevates the restoration of Yahweh worship to become a national goal, not just the fulfillment of his pet project. So in 1 Chronicles 13, it says David, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, if it seems good to you, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our brothers throughout the territories of Israel and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we, we did not inquire it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all the people. David casts a vision to the nation saying, we must restore worship as central to who we are. And he gets the people to buy into it. It's incredible. And then we see, and we don't have time to go into all the stories, but we see when he brings the ark, the first thing he does, he has a tent that he builds for it. And he worships before it. And in 2 Samuel 7, he goes to the prophet Nathan. He goes, I, am, I, I can't sleep because here I am in my kingly palace and the presence of God resides in a tent. And I must do something for it. We see in David's life this immense care and concern for the presence of God. This idea that he, he can't sleep because the presence of God is sitting in a tent and he's living in a palace. And I ask us, do, do we have the same level of care and concern for the presence of God in our lives? Do we honor the presence of God to the point like David where we can't sleep because the presence has been left outside somewhere and it needs to be made central again? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go somewhere we don't often go, but in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul writes this. He says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? See, in the Old Testament, the, the presence rested on the ark, in the, temp, in, in the tent and in the temple. But Paul says, no, it, now in the new covenant, your body, this vessel is the temple. This is where the Holy Spirit resides. This is where God's presence is. So if we follow this thread to its natural, logical conclusion, worship begins to look a lot more than just singing and dancing. If this is where the presence resides, if we have a care and concern for his presence, then things like our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health, and our spiritual health, how we take care of this vessel become acts of worship. That suddenly going to the gym and exercising to keep our bodies healthy becomes an act of worship. That suddenly cultivating healthy relationships so we have an emotional health in our life becomes an act of worship. That suddenly um, our work-life balance and how we handle stress and anxiety and our mental health becomes an act of worship. That our personal devotions, what we do every day to connect with God and our church involvement in going to life group and coming to church becomes an act of worship. Because if this is where the presence resides and we have a care and concern and want to honor his presence in our life, then we have a responsibility to take care of ourselves physically and spiritually and emotionally and mentally. And these activities that keep us healthy become acts of worship to God. So the application for us is that we must have 
a passion for his presence. I challenge us to have a level of care and concern for his presence that David did, one that wakes us up at night, that we need to expand our understanding of worship beyond just singing and dancing to the idea of exercise and keeping ourselves spiritually healthy and cultivating good relationships and work-life balance. All of these become acts of worship. Where is your level of care and concern for the presence of God in your life? And the last story is this, because we're running close to being out of time. Go back to 2 Samuel, but jump to the very end. 2 Samuel chapter 24. And like I said, David, I'm encouraged because he's so human. And even at the end of his life, he was still making mistakes. Chapter 24 picks up where God had asked David to take a census of the nation. And David, in his pride and arrogance, decided to take a census of the fighting men. He wanted to prove how mighty he was. He wanted to prove how strong he was. He wanted to prove the physical might that the nation held. And of course, God called him on that. He's like, you, you disobeyed me again. You obviously don't trust in me. You obviously have a lack of humility in your life because instead of doing what I ask, you're just trying to like puff up yourself and prove how strong you are. So in 2 Samuel chapter 24, starting in verse 18, after David has realized his mistake, it says, On that day, Gad went to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. When Arunia looked the, and saw the king and his men coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Arunia said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the Lord, that the plague on the people may be stopped. Arunia said to David, let my lord the king take whatever pleases him and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and here are threshing sledges and ox yokes for the, for the wood. Basically, David's saying, let me buy your floor so I can build an altar. And the guy said, no, 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 you're the king. He's, it's free. Take it all. It's free. And then in verse 24, the king replied, no, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. You see, true worship requires humility. And true worship will always cost us something. You know, obviously God gives his grace and his love freely, but to worship fully and truly will cost us something. It may cost us our time. It might be inconvenient to get up early and find a spot alone to worship and to pray and to read our word. It might cost us our time. It might cost us our attention. Our attention is drawn in so many places nowadays. Everything is vying for our attention. And it may cost us extra time scrolling through on our phone. It may cost us extra time doing something else that we like, but it may cost us our attention. It may cost us respect. You know, David's wife had no respect for him that day they danced before the Lord. And true worship in the eyes of others will often cost us respect because we are undignifying ourselves before the Lord. And in their eyes, they can no longer respect us for those actions. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 and 16, it says, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The idea of a sacrifice of praise, that true worship will always cost us something. And I love that once again in this scripture, it expands the definition of worship, that worship is now doing good, that fighting injustice is an act of worship. And it says sharing what you have, sacrificing your material wealth and your possessions is an act of worship. It will cost you something, but it's an act of worship. And if we go to the the very end, Romans 12, verse 1. If you want to look at what a life of worship will actually cost you, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In the end, true worship will cost you your life. It's right there, black and white in the scripture. True worship will cost you your life. We give it all up. And we lay it all down before Jesus. Lord, have your way in me. So this morning as we come to a close, the first question I want to ask is, what are you willing to lay down this morning? When you walk in those doors on a Sunday morning into this place of worship, what are you willing to lay down? Are you willing to lay down the junk of your week at those doors? Are you willing to lay down the argument you had on the way to church in the morning? Are you willing to lay down how hungry you are before it's even lunchtime? Are you willing to weigh down, lay down what someone else might think of you to dance and abandon for the Lord? When you walk through those doors, what are you willing to lay down to worship him? When you wake up in the morning, 
What are you willing to lay down? Are you willing to lay down your agenda for the day? Are you willing to lay down um, what the anxiety and stress you have for the day? Are you willing to lay down the extra hour you want to sleep in? What are you willing to lay down to worship the Lord? When the enemy throws his very worst at you, what are you willing to lay down? Are you willing to lay down your own strength? Are you willing to lay down your status, your possessions? Are you willing to lay down everything to worship the Lord? I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. So come to a close. David demonstrates what it means to be broken before the Lord. And ultimately, that's an integral part of the idea of a heart of worship is the idea of brokenness. And brokenness is a funny thing because we're all broken people. And the beauty of the gospel is that God takes our broken pieces and, and amends us back to someone who is whole and restored and rebuilt. But there's a measure of brokenness that must remain, a brokenness and a humility before him as God. And a lot of times this inability to embrace a heart of worship is from a lack of brokenness. And I'll be honest, I'm not really into playing church or playing around this morning. I think there's some people here this morning who haven't yet broken before God. And that brokenness might look like a variety of things. Perhaps there needs to be a brokenness in the area of pride and appearance. And you need to just dance like a fool before God this morning. Perhaps it's a brokenness in the area of priorities and how you structure your life. That you need to have a heart for his house. You need to have a heart for his presence. You need to have a care and concern for what his spirit looks like in your life. Maybe the brokenness is in the area of sacrifice and security and what you're holding on to and you aren't really willing to pay something. You're not really willing to sacrifice or pay the cost to truly enter in to worship and to have a heart that is completely abandoned and expectant before God. I don't know about you, but I want to live a life where God can look at me and say, there is a man after my own heart. And I hope the same is true for you. There is a man after God's own heart. There is a, a woman after God's own heart. There is a child after God's own heart. I hope and pray that that is your heart's desire. As we come to a close this morning, I've asked the team to lead us. I'm going to trust Erica to go where she feels we need to go song-wise. But I think, though we've run a little bit late, we're still not quite done. There's a moment here where some of us need to just break before the Lord in worship. We need to have that revelation moment like I had when someone put a, an album into my hand where everything changes. And I realize in this moment what a heart of worship looks like and what it truly looks like to give my passions and my desires and my very life over to God in worship. So I'm going to pray for us and the team's going to lead us. I guess encourage you to respond as you need to. If you need to bow, bow. If you need to dance, dance. If you need to sit, sit. If you need to stand, stand. If you need to sing at the top of your lungs, go for it. I don't care, and no one else should either. God, we thank you so much for your word this morning, and I pray, I pray above everything else, Lord God, that, that there be no distraction, that my words would not take away from what you're speaking to us this morning, that you long for us to come to you in childlike faith with a heart of worship that says, God, I give everything to you. Earnestly, I seek you in everything I do. I don't want to live this life if it's not for you in everything that I do. God, devote myself to you. I worship you. I live worship 24-7. So I pray in these next few moments that you would just have your way in this place. So whatever needs to happen, God, we just give it over to you. And I pray for anyone who is holding back, for anyone who is still holding on to something of the natural. God, I pray for brokenness. I pray for walls to come down. I pray for strongholds to break. And I pray that we would break before you this morning, Lord God, in worship to your name. Amen.